1 Timothy chapter 3, chapter 5, and chapter 6 to start this evening. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. It's true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Qualifications listed among them. Verse number 4, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man knoweth how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Verse 15, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Chapter 6 and verse 1, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. In chapter 5 and verse 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Heavenly Father, bless your word to our hearts tonight. Help me to speak the truth in the way that it should be spoken and help us all to, to leave here better for having uh, come. And we thank you in Jesus' name and amen. As, as your culture, your society, uh, by, seemingly by design, sets itself against the word of God and rejects knowingly or unknowingly, all the principles of the Word of God, we pay a heavy price for it in every aspect of our, of our national and our individual lives. There was a time when this nation was the great absolute nation on the face of the earth because we were anchored in the principles of biblical Christianity. Today, today, through the constant barrage of news media propaganda, it is now a, 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 an honorable thing to raise a child without a husband and a husband father has no honor. It is now an honorable thing to be a, a rebel who riots and steals, who lives off the government. It's a dishonorable thing to be a successful captain of industry, uh, someone who has made wealth for himself and for others by establishing a business or uh, in, uh, inventing something and developing that. Uh, when, I, when I was a boy, the, the, there were hero tales told about men who made careers and livings possible for tens of thousands of people. Now those are cruel, evil capitalists who, who take advantage of the working class. And believe it or not, there was a time in our nation when pastors, ministers of the Word of God were respected. And as your nation has come to disrespect leadership in the home as God ordained it and leadership in, in the business world as God ordained it and leadership in the church as God ordained it. Uh, what you've done is you've promoted the voice and the power of rebellion yeah. and rebellion and disobedience never ends well for a life or for a nation. Uh, if, if, if a, a school teacher makes national news it's not for skillfully educating boys and girls, it's for molesting one of them. If a minister makes, makes the, the headlines, it's not for turning souls to Christ and rescuing the perishing, it's because he stole some money or ran off with a woman. Or, are, are we saying that, that it's okay for a minister to do that? No, no, what we're saying is the constant propaganda to emphasize the one person in leadership who failed so that all leadership is resented 
It turns the parents against the teachers. It turns the citizens against their law enforcement officers. It turns the church members against those who could preach the word of God to them and help them. It turns people against the person who could actually give them a job and, and give them a, a, a way up out of poverty and into a better way of living. So this, this cultural rebellion it's easy to sell because everybody's got a fallen nature that resents authority and likes to rebel. That was, uh, that was in Satan from the beginning, and, and that's how he came at, at the woman in the garden. Uh, you, mean, you mean God? Who's he to tell you you can't eat of this tree? And so there, there's something in the heart of every one of us that resents authority. Yet the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3, the members of a family should give honor to the man who rules that household. And if he rules it well, he should have the respect, the reverence of wife and children. That's, that's taught in the Bible. In 1 Timothy 6, the man who gets up and goes to work and, and has a place to earn a living so he can pay his bills and buy things for his family uh, should honor the man who invested in that company and invested in him enough to do his very best for that man. He should honor his employer. And you can almost feel a, a laugh being suppressed when you say that. Who taught you to laugh at that idea? Yeah. Amen. Someone invested millions of dollars of capital that they're on the hook for. Yeah. So you could have a place to go to work. Should be appreciated and respected and and people should do their best for that man, not steal from that man with their time or with their property. And then the Bible says, when you come to the house of God and the church of God, the people I have put to labor there and to rule there, they should not only be honored, they should be given double honor. Because you can, you can recover from not having the right kind of father in the home. You can recover from not having the right kind of employer when you're starting out in your career. It's hard to recover if you've been misled from the pulpit. It's hard to recover if you've not been fed the word of God and taught the truths of scripture. Is it important to have a good home? Sure. In this day and age, where would you learn to have a good home if it wasn't in a good church? Is it important to have a good career and be financially stable and solvent? Yes, but if you didn't learn that in a church from the Bible, where would you learn it? And so uh, of, uh, of the bedrocks of our society, the home, industry, relationship to God. The Lord says more vital than them all is the house of God. Amen. Your house is better if you're in the right house of God. Amen. The place where you work is better if you're working in the right house of God. And so the Bible says that fathers should be honored, husbands should be honored, Teachers should be honored, employers should be honored, leadership and society should be honored, but double honor to those who labor in the word and labor in doctrine. If, if, you, if you find for me church members who speak with disrespect for their ministers, you will find church members who have problems at home and problems at work because it's not a minister problem it's a respect problem yeah. it's an attitude toward leadership problem right. if you find people who can't hold a job they probably can't stay in a church if you find people who can't stay married and, and their marriage is always in turmoil they're probably in turmoil at church as well and the disrespect across our nation for men who labor in the word of God and labor in doctrine has been as hurtful or more as any of the things that have brought about the deterioration of our society. 
Tonight, more, more people who profess to be Christians are out of church than in church. Why aren't they in church tonight? They don't need to hear a preacher. Well, why do you need to hear a man call a ball game? Why do you need to hear a man give the news? Why do you need to hear your favorite internet secret website uh, give you the latest info on your conspiracy theory of the week? Why, why do you give honor to those voices? Why time and attention to those voices? And so this, this, this testimony that we have in America that I love God, I just don't love church. And I follow Jesus, I just don't have a pastor that I respect. You're not loving God if you're disobeying God, and you're not following Jesus if you're not doing what he told you to do. And he told you that the person in your life that should have the highest place of honor is the person who labors in the Word of God and teaches you the doctrines of the Bible. And, and I, I have spent my lifetime trying to help men who thought their wife was the problem or their children was the problem or their boss was the problem. And the problem was they could never get in a church and sit under the teaching of a pastor. Everything else is just rolling downhill from that starting point. And every, every man who starts a business does so to make money. That's, that's an American thing. It's a, it's a Bible thing. And every man who starts a business to make money is looking to hire people who will help him make money. And if they help him make money, he will help them make money. But if you're, if you're incapable of submitting to someone who has a job to offer you and you don't have a job to offer him and, and there's a job, will you take it? Yes, but you're not going to tell me what to do. Then I'm not going to employ you. I get a mortgage to pay, and I've got creditors to pay, and I've got supplies coming in I've got to pay for. I stay in business because my customers are happy, and my customers aren't happy if the people waiting on them or serving them or, or working for them are spreading unhappiness. So the problem is not every boss man you've ever had. The problem is the attitude you've taken to every job you've ever had. We see it in the home. Chaos and turmoil and unhappiness. Why? Well, there's a, a clear order laid out by God. I want the man to do this, and I want the woman to do that, and I want the parent to do this, and I want the child to do that. Well, nobody's going to tell me what to do. That's true. And if that's true, it's not going to just be if nobody in the pulpit's going to tell me what to do. If God can't tell me what to do in his house, he's certainly not going to be free to tell me what to do in my own house. So we have all of these areas where we look in our world and we see our, our society eroding round about us. And no, one, no one wants to point the finger at the one thing that all of these areas of decay have in common. And that's that we've been educated out of respect for authority and leadership and educated into rebellion and independence and defiance. And it's not a good thing. Amen. I'm old enough now, I start many paragraphs with this statement. But when I was a boy <laughs> in this county in a secular school, and my teacher gave an assignment, and I did not do the assignment, and I did not get the grade that. I desired because I hadn't done the assignment. There was no thought that my father or mother would blame the teacher. There was no thought that my father or mother would call the principal on the carpet. No thought that my father or mother would teach me to continue rebelling against the assignment that I was given by tearing down the authority figures in my life so that I thought the way to success was just say, no, I'm not doing it. 
Well, fast forward, and now you've got people who get saved, praise the Lord, and start going to church, praise the Lord. But when a man stands in the pulpit and opens the Bible and says, Thus saith the Lord, here's your assignment. I'm not doing that. I don't have to do that. You can't tell me what to do. You are right. No preacher can tell you what to do. And you just keep floundering through life like you floundered through school, like you floundered through one job after another, and it's not a good path for you, for your family, for your nation. Amen. Amen. Those who cannot honor other people but want other people to honor them, you're going to be so disappointed in life. Very, very disappointed in life. And so the Bible says in verse 17 of chapter 5, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Uh, they're not going to demand it of you. If they did, it would, it would not be successful. It's up to you to allow that to happen. Let them be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. No, no sincere, no righteous minister wants to talk about what I'm about to talk about. And if you've never been here before, it's just, it just happened by chance that you're here tonight. Come to every service for a year and you won't hear this again. Because we teach right through a, through a book of the Bible. But if you, if you work on automobile engines, if you do construction work, if you have a lawn business, if you're in AC and, and heating repair, uh, if, you, if you studied and trained and worked and took the call and examined the problem and evaluated the need, and ordered the parts, and came and did the work, and repaired the, the device. And the person said, I don't know why you expect me to pay you for that. Why didn't you do that because you love the Lord? Why didn't you do that out of the goodness of your heart? Why didn't you do that because you were supposed to do it? You'd say, are you kidding me? Were you some kind of crook? This is how I make my living. This is how I feed my family. And you knew that going in. Yes, sir. And you took what I had to give you and now you begrudge the fact that it cost you something to receive that. And it's an odd thing, isn't it? In our passage, it's an odd thing that people wouldn't, wouldn't think about not paying the mechanic, not paying the yard man, not paying the carpenter, not paying the whoever it is that, that did work for them, but it doesn't bother them a bit to squeeze everything they want out of a church and never give a dollar to that church. We don't pass an offering plate, never have, never will. We don't send you solicitation letters, never have, never will. It's not about money, it's about your attitude. It's not about money, it's about your heart. It's about people claiming I'm a right-wing conservative, I don't like all these welfare moochers, and you go to church and mooch like a welfare crowd. I shouldn't have to pay for that, I shouldn't have to contribute to that, have activities for my kids, drive vans for my kids to ride in, make sure they're clean, make sure they're well maintained, make sure the mechanic keeps them good, have a security team so my kids are safe, have, have, have meals for my family, and don't ask me to contribute anything. But I'm a great ring conservative. I don't think so. Maybe in your secular life, but not in your church life. And the Bible says if you, if you are going to make certain that anything stayed open, if you were going to make certain that any building was maintained, if you were going to make certain that anyone who worked for you had the time to do it and was compensated for doing so, it ought to be the people looking after your soul, not the people looking after your stuff. 
Man, I don't, that, we're not going to take the big annual fundraiser and squeeze you for nickels and all that. I'm telling you, it's a heart thing. Yes, sir. It's an attitude thing. And you don't have a preacher that hits you up for money. But you shouldn't resent it if he did. And you're in a church that doesn't pass an offering plate. Yes, sir. But why would it bother you if they did? Yeah. Everywhere you go to eat a meal and feed your face, you expect to pay for it and f freak out when you don't know which button to hit on the tip thing. <laughs> Who decided it starts at 15, then 18, then 25, then? <laughs> to quote Gerald Sutek, if 10 percent's enough for God, it ought to be enough for a waitress. But that, that's. Uh, <laughs> But I, I take a little side trip there and with apologies to all you waitresses. It, it, is, it is a blessing that we have reached the place that we have as a church. But let, let, me, let me take you back in time. We rented a building. We started, church, started a church. I've done that three times in three cities. And the first church worked full-time, paid the expenses of the church out of my paycheck and out of my pocket. We started the second church, and two of us did that. We, we paid the expenses out of our pocket, paid the church expenses out of our paycheck, and then we started this church, and for, for nine and one-half years, I didn't take a dime. And, and many times through those years, it was, was asked and was encouraged, and we said, no, no, we, we need to... We need to get out of a rented building, have our own building. We need to have our own facility. We need to, I, I, I'm capable of working. and we could, but, but here's what happens. Your church grows. Praise the Lord. And there's only so many days your employer will let you take off for funerals, for weddings, for wedding rehearsals, for marriage counseling, for being there when someone's in trouble, for racing to meet someone at the emergency room, and, and all of these things that, you might only need once every two or three years from your pastor. Someone else needed them last week and someone else will need them this week. And it's not all about you. It's yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we hope that all day today, we hope we don't hear the sirens from the fire station next door. We hope that all day we don't hear the ringing of the ambulance as it goes out and tries to get through the intersection. But those times when my mother fell, I sure was glad somebody was sitting over there waiting for a call. And, and I, hope, I hope that all this year goes by and I hope you never need a police officer. Hope you never need a sheriff's deputy. But for all that you resent about paying taxes, it's pretty nice to hit 911 and have somebody answer. And it's pretty nice to say, I got a guy trying to break into my house and have somebody come with the means to stop him. Yeah. I'll stop him myself. Yeah, okay, it's pretty nice to be able to afford the lawyer after you do that. <laughs> what, what I'm telling you is there are people in our lives that we pay not to do something for us every day, but to be there for us on the days we need them. How much more for those who minister God's truth and God's comfort to us in those times of our life when we really need it? Your town will have days to honor firefighters. I'm all for that. They'll have days to honor law enforcement. I'm all for that. They'll have days to honor uh, rescue crews. I'm all for that. They used to have days to honor the ministers in town. They don't do that anymore. They don't do that anymore. Why not? Well, half the church people in town don't even honor their ministers. You sure wouldn't expect the town to do it. So here's the idea. I was talking with uh, Brother Juan. We were coming in. We were talking about automobiles, and, and he's, he's driving this really nice-looking gold uh, 
Highlander sharp car. And um, I can tell you it rides really well. And he said, why did you get rid of that car? And I said, because about once a month I make a thousand mile trip. And if I'm in the middle of South Carolina and something in that 200,000 mile car goes out, I don't know what it is and I don't know what to do about it. And I want to be able to call somebody who actually studied mechanics. Not somebody who just decided he was going to be a mechanic when he opened the hood, God would lead him. <laughs> and you might not believe this, but God wrote this book to guide us and direct us through our lives. And if you're working the kind of hours that I know you are, and you ladies are devoting the kind of hours to your home and family that I know you are, it's, you're doing pretty good to get that half hour devotional in, which includes your prayer time, your meditation time, your Bible reading time, so wouldn't it be nice to have someone master this book who could take what, what little free time you have in a week and teach you a book that you'd like to learn but don't have the time to learn. And teach you how to apply this book to your life in areas that you never thought you'd need to apply this book to your life. And if that man that you've never met at a phone call comes out and, and gets your vehicle going by the side of the road, brings the parts with him, puts the right parts in, any decent person would say, man, I sure appreciate it. What do I owe you? Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. What a blessing. We've had, we've had fires at our house. Well, we had fires at our house. My daughter drove up one night and her car, just flames shooting out from under the hood. God spared her life. Thank the Lord. Here came the fire department. For years we called the FPL. So the trees were sparking. The power trains were all grown up in the power lines. Somebody got to come cut them down. They never came cut them down. Started a forest fire burning up all, all around the house out there. Then they sent the tree trimming crew out after the trees were dead from the fire. <laughs> Guy said, y'all don't have any money. Said, how, how you figure? He said, well, rich people, we do this once a year. Middle class people, we do this every two years. We ain't never been out here. <laughs> we had a tree. This is true. One of the power lines, the tree had grown around it. It was, it was in the, anyway. And, we had other, and, and so, you know, when that fire department comes out there, you know what you think? You just, for, for about six months, you say, I'm okay with property taxes. So I couldn't afford that truck and that truck. And I couldn't afford eight guys to sit around and wait till I needed them to come out and use those trucks. Glad to pay it. And people come to church and I don't know why I have to give. You know who says that? It's not about money. You don't appreciate it. Because you'd appreciate that guy fixing your car, and you'd appreciate that guy putting out the fire in the woods by your house. And something in our culture has taught us to not appreciate the person who labors in the Word of God and teaches us the Bible. And the Lord said, double honor. Amen. Double honor. You now, you guys that are in Bible school, and some of you preparing for the ministry, and some of you about getting ready to head out and be in the ministry... Well, I'll tell you a little something here that, that will just really thrill your heart. <laughs> Verse number 18. Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward. Come to 1 Corinthians 9. We'll read, read you this passage along with it. 1 Corinthians 9. Verse number 7. Who goeth a warfare at any time of his own charges? I don't like, I, I, everybody ought to have to do what, what some of us do and write a check four times a year and send in your tax money. 
they just take it out of your paycheck. You almost don't know it's gone. But when you had it and you got to give it away. But then I think my entire life until the last year or so, no one's invaded the United States. I'm glad we have a military so strong that we don't have to use it. I'd rather pay for that than have armies running back and forth across our nation every five years. So he says in verse 7, you don't have to go to war. Somebody go to war for you. You just pay the money for it. Who planteth a vineyard, eateth not the fruit thereof. I like going to the grocery store and getting grapes and grape juice. I don't steal it. Amen. I pay for it. Because it costs somebody a lot of money to grow it. Yes, sir. And harvest it and pack it and ship it and pay the money to have a grocery store and pay the money to have, I started to say somebody at the checkout counter, but I stand in line. I don't want to put somebody out of a job. Anyway. And so, so plant a vineyard, eateth not the fruit thereof. Who feedeth the flock, and eateth not the milk of the flock. Say these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Does God take care for oxen? You think God wrote that because He cares about a, a cow? Or saith He altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? You pay the grocer for your milk so the farmer can get paid to keep producing milk, and you pay the grocer for your grapes so the vineyard owner can keep growing grapes, and you, you pay the grocer for your meat so the rancher can keep growing the cattle. And go to church and say, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. Preach. And don't ask for a dime. Because you're supposed to do it for me. If you act that way at the grocery store, you'd be one of the people we complain about. <laughs> you believe that? They just went there and stole all that food and just took it like they were entitled to it or something? People go to church and take everything God's got to give them like they were entitled to it. Ho, oh, ho. You come back for a year, you won't hear this again. But here, here it is. Here it is. Tonight, we've got we to gotta deal with it. So, guys, here's what I was going to tell you. And I, I, I mentioned this morning, uh, if, you've, if you've never seen, you've never seen this, this ox at the wheel, big post, and a smaller post running through that, that movable post. And on the one end is a, is a big millstone, big heavy wheel. And on the other end, they harness up this, this ox. And they throw the grain on the floor. And the ox, all day long, he walks around in a circle. And that wheel on the other end grinds that, that grain so the farmer can have bread and sell meal and people in town can have bread. And the Lord said, do not put a muzzle on that ox. If he wants to stop and eat some of the grain that he's working for you, he's entitled to it. Amen. And the Lord said, you know, I, I'm talking about your preacher. But here's what I want to tell you guys, you're just so thrilled about going in the ministry you have any idea how boring that would be? <laughs> that ox all day long is just walking around in a circle, pulling that wheel, walking around in a circle, pulling that wheel, walking around in a circle, pulling that wheel. You know something? You're going to do this job right. It's going to be hours and hours and hours on your knees in prayer, that's not exciting. Hours and hours and hours studying your Bible, that's not exciting. Hours and hours and hours putting messages together, that's not exciting. 
and you get this one little window where you get to pour out from your heart the grain so everybody can get fed. And many times, even that's not real exciting. <laughs> you know what, you know what that, that man, you know why he doesn't shoot that ox? Because it's faithful. You know why that ox doesn't run away? That's his job. So in the book of Numbers, you, I'm, that's it, I'm dropping out of Bible school. Okay, but, but I'm just trying to help you here. In the book of Numbers, and, and no point turning there because I can't read you all uh, 36 chapters of it tonight. It is campsites and commandments and ordinances and instructions and then there's a rebellion and murmuring and complaining and a plague. And campsites and relocation and commandments and instructions. And then somebody else gets griping and God sends another plague. And the book of Numbers records 40 years of Moses' life as a pastor. And there's only like five exciting things that ever happened. And all of them were bad. <laughs> well, I want to go into ministry. I want a big church like Moses had. Well, prepare to get in a harness and just go around in a circle and, and grind out grain so other people can get fed. That's the job. And the Bible says it requires that a steward, a minister, be found faithful. Because that's the job. But the idea that you would go and scoop up the grain and break your bread and butter it and sit there and say, wow, this is really good bread, and muzzle that ox and let the ox starve while he made your bread, it's not about money, it's about attitude. Yeah. It's not about money, it's about not looking at life properly. If someone feeds me, I should feed them. Yes, sir. That's right. And if I would feed the people who fed me physical food, how much more those who feed me spiritual food? Yes, yes, Man should not live by bread alone, but if you have an NIV, I have to stop there. But, <laughs> ESV, but in the, in the Holy Bible, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so if I need God's word more than I need groceries, I should compensate my minister at least in the same way I compensate my grocer. All right, Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6. <laughs> I'm never coming back there. Well, you pick another church, you'll hear about this a lot more than every now and then. Offering, special offering, building fund offering, missions offering, and then send the kids around to get the coins that are left. <laughs> Galatians 6, verse number 6. Let him that is taught in the word, that's a blessing, that's why you're here, communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Fair enough. So the man communicates the word of God to you and you communicate to him what he needs to be able to communicate the word of God to you. Now, who would think this is in, in the context, but it is. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You know, I work so hard and I get paid so little. I work so hard and the government takes so much of it. I pour my life into something. I don't get any appreciation. The Lord said, that might be, that might be harvest time for how you act at the church house. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good preaching. You, you might want to check up on that. Because if the person who's worthy of double honor and it's not you isn't getting any honor, there may be a reason why you're being treated dishonorably. Matter, matter of sowing and reaping. I don't know who gives and who doesn't give, and I don't want to know. I've never looked. I'm not going to look. I don't want to know. 
but if, if you don't want to reap, I worked really, really hard and got nothing out of it. Don't sow. Someone worked really, really hard for me and got nothing out of it. That's, that's the context. All right, one more, one more stop tonight, and then we'll, we'll sing a song and get happy again and, and uh, be on our way. 1 Corinthians 16, verse number 1. Now concerning the collection, 1 Corinthians 16, 1. Now concerning collection for the saints, as I've given order in the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him. There be no gatherings when I come. All right, so first of all, on what day do Christian churches meet? The first day of the week. On what day do Jews meet who observe the Jews' religion? On the Sabbath day, the last day of the week. Christians are not Jews, and Jews can become Christians, but they don't continue to practice Judaism. They begin to practice Christianity. That's what you find in the book of Acts. And in, in the book of Acts, those who converted from Judaism to Christianity converted from Sabbath worship to first day of the week gathering. Yes, sir. So that's, that's point number one in the Bible. Number two, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you, so, in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, whom did the Holy Spirit command to be in church on the first day of every week? Every Christian. Amen. Every Christian. Yes, sir. Your living room is not... Amen. If you're starting a church in your living room because there is not a church in your town, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about people who resent authority and leadership and just won't go to church even though God told them to because nobody's going to tell me what to do. No, no preacher's going to tell me what to do. Well, how could a preacher tell you what to do if God can't tell you what to do? I mean, no one would expect a preacher to be able to tell you what to do if God can't tell you what to do. So God said, first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him. So who is supposed to meet on the first day of the week? All saved people. When the church gathers on the first day of the week, who's supposed to be there? All saved people. And when the saved people gather on the first day of the week, who's supposed to give? All saved people. Pretty simple. As God hath prospered him. Now that's, that's pretty vague. Pretty vague. So let's just, just make a, a few quick points and then we'll move along. If you have a dog and a cat, God's prospered you because you don't have to have that. It's extra money. If you've got a $900 cell phone and monthly internet charges, God's prospered you. You don't have to have that. If you've got food in your pantry and your refrigerator and you go out to eat... You don't have to do that. God's prospered you. I, look, I, I'm not begrudging people any of those things. I'm simply saying most of us don't need a pair of shoes. Most of us don't need another suit of clothing. Most of us don't need another gadget. Most of us don't need another toy. God's prospered us. Some of you guys are just getting started. Some of you girls are just getting started and you're, you're scraping just to get by. Praise the Lord. But most of us are not scraping to get by. We think nothing stopping buying something to quench our thirst because it's cold and it's now and it's like three miles before I get home. We're used to getting what we want when we want it, and if we don't have the money, we'll credit card it and hope manna falls down from heaven and we can pay off the credit card. So we're living in pretty good measure of prosperity. 
and it's, it's an interesting thing that what I want, I have money for, but I don't have any money for my church. That's a heart thing. It's not a giving thing. This sermon's not about money. It's not about giving. It's about the heart. We spend money on what is important to us. And it tells God how I feel about his house if I don't contribute at his house. All right. Now, last point for the evening. If you're listening to my voice and you're a minister and you're listening to my voice and you're a missionary and you're listening to my voice and you're an evangelist and you're listening to my voice and you're in some kind of parachurch ministry with no accountability, whatever that is, I'm just telling you, when men and women get up in the morning and go to work and work hard all day and bring home their paycheck and give up some of that money so you can be, quote unquote, working for the Lord, you better be working for the Lord. And, and these, these preachers who are loafers, these ministers who are lazy, and these men that demand they be, they be uh, treated like, uh, like royalty and, and given these vast sums of money and support and so forth. You're part of the reason why people don't want to give. Because they feel like you're ripping them off. And shame on you if you contribute to that. And if somewhere out there in cyberland you're on the mission field and you told a church you were going to go somewhere and do something and you went somewhere but you ain't doing it, you're going to answer to God for taking money away from men and their wives and their children having deceived churches so you could go hang out somewhere and do nothing. I would be so scared to stand before God having done that. You think you're out there with no accountability and you think you're out there with no, where nobody knows what you're doing. Almighty God knows what yeah. you're doing and Almighty God is going to have you give account for what you did with the money we sent your way to do what you said you were going to do. I'd, I'd search my heart about that. I'd, I'd make sure. I, I don't want any man that contributes to, to my upkeep, my family's upkeep. I don't want any man to put in more hours than I do. I don't want anybody that's paying my way to outwork me. God helping me. It's getting tough now is the, uh, the sign that says, you know, home a thousand miles. It's down to like home 50 miles. And I, I, I'm just, just getting close to the end of the road here. But I just, this, this, if a minister is to be worthy of double honor, he shouldn't just expect that to be given to him. He should earn it. He should earn it. And, and nobody should have any question about whether or not you're, uh, the person you're supporting is working and, and laboring. It's hard, it's hard to get a church to give to missions because they've heard so many stories about missionaries who weren't on a mission. And all you guys getting ready to head out and go do something Make sure you do it. And when you get up in the morning, you say, I'm not doing anything today. Well, just send back one, one thirtieth of what they sent you for that month. You're going to do nothing for a week, send back one week of it. You're going to take a year off. <laughs> I'm going to start a pastor's union so we can get furloughs. I'd like to spend a year visiting my supporting church. <laughs> a lot of guys sitting around. Buddy Tucker, he was a good friend. He owned WYND for years and years. We owned that radio station for many, many years. And he said, I'd like to have more local preachers on my station but most of them are more concerned about lowering their golf handicap than winning souls to Christ. Oh, 
I'd like to have a low handicap, but it, <laughs> not at the expense of the ministry. So, Lord, help us. You guys going to go into ministry? Be honorable. Don't go in it for the money. Don't go in it for the money. You might be disappointed. <laughs> or you might get the money and be a disappointment to people. Go in it for the Lord. But if you're in a church, in a good church, and you get ministered to from the Word of God, um, if you're going to cut something out of your budget, it shouldn't be your church. Because it's, it's worth double what everything else in your life is worth. It's what, it's what the Lord said. It's what the Lord said. All right. Well, that was awkward. But we got through it. Amen. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for writing all these things in the Bible that we need for our lives. And pray that you'd help us, God, have a good attitude and a right attitude toward leadership in our life and authority in our life. And those that are in leadership positions, God, help them to, to be worthy and noble. And Father, just help us, we pray. Bless your word to our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.